Well, good morning uh, and good to see you again, uh, committee. And we have some new uh, folks with us um, this morning. We're going to do uh, this uh, hearing in regards to <clears throat> yeah, our farm to plate program. And uh, this is the um, 10th year retro um, Perspective uh, joint hearing of both committees um, to handle this uh, and to hear uh, your report and updates and all the good work that's been happening. Um, to start with, I guess we'll introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Bobby Starr and I'm Senator from Essex and Orleans County. Uh, Chris? Good morning, Chris Pearson from Chittenden. <laughs> Ryan Caldwell, representing the Rutland County Senate District. Corey Parent, uh, I represent Franklin County in Albert. And uh, Anthony, Senator Polina is at a doctor's appointment, but hopefully will be with us. Carolyn, uh, would you like to introduce your committee, please? Sure. Um, we'll go around the table. We'll start with Tom. I'm a representative of Tom Bach. I represent the towns of Chester, Andover, Baltimore, and a part of North Springfield. Representative Terry Norris. I represent Benson, Orwell, Shoreham, and Whitey. Uh, representative Heather Supernaut. I represent the towns of Barnard, Pomfret, Beachy, and West Hartford. Representative Rodney Graham. I represent Williamstown, Chelsea, Berkshire, Trent, Washington, and Orange. And I'm representing <laughs> Partridge, I represent the towns of Athens, Brooklyn, and Grafton, part of North Westminster, all of Rockingham, and my hometown of Wyndham. I'm Representative Henry Pearl. I represent Cabot, Danville, and Peachum. And we also have Vicki Strong, who is not in the room at the moment. She, um, I'm not going to attempt to name all of her towns, but she comes from the town of Albany. So thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, did you have anything you wanted to say before? Oh, no, we go? Oh, John. Bobby, we forgot. I forgot John because he's not in the room. John, you go ahead. Well, we'll uh, we'll get started. So, uh, you know, the last <laughs> meeting ran over because we didn't get going maybe as quickly as we could with our witnesses, um, and so I I have a list of names. Um, and I think we'll start right off with Jake, who's the uh, director of the S Sustainable Jobs uh, Fund or of the program. Yeah, the, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give the, the directorship over to Ellen, who <laughs> well, is the ED of VSJF. And I, yeah, I'm the program director. <laughs> you're the program director. Okay, yeah. did you want to lead off or you want to have Ellen lead off? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm lead off and... Uh, and then we'll have Ellen uh, towards the end here, but um, yeah, th <laughs> thanks, thanks for that dis for that distinction, Bobby. Um, uh, I, I now was the director of the Jobs Fund for about five seconds, so that's that's great. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> um, well, Lind Linda's the one that moved you up, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it's it's. Uh, yeah, it's always always a always a pleasure. Um, thank you, Senator Starr and and Representative Partridge. It's it's really, um, yeah, a great privilege to uh, always be able to present to both committees. Um, and certainly, I think this might be the third time we're doing this virtually. I can say it's it's always yeah. better to to do it in person, but it's it's nonetheless a, a privilege to be here. So we're very thankful for the opportunity and. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, share a, a, a slide deck and, and kind of run through a lot of things. Um, so let me just get that set up and then we'll, we'll be off and running. Um, okay. Did you want to introduce any of your guests, uh, Jake? Yeah. So, so we, um, so following me, we'll have Abby Willard uh, from the agency of agriculture, uh, food and markets. And then after Abby, um, Abby Course um, from the Course uh, Family Dairy um, and the co-chair of the Ag and Ecosystem Subcommittee of the Climate Council will be presenting. She's on vacation in Florida, so I'm going to essentially text her when uh, I need her to join. <laughs> 
And we're very thankful that Abby is, of course, is taking that time uh, uh, out of her vacation to still present here today. Um, and yeah, a well, well-deserved vacation for Abby course. And then um, Ellen will have a couple of uh, closing remarks uh, to close up and we'll try to fit in um, you know, questions throughout, uh, questions and answers throughout that. Yeah, sounds so, good. Um, yeah, so let me now uh, get my slides going here. And one second. Oh. This is always uh, a tricky part of, I've got to share first and then I'll, this might seem odd to start, but here we go. All right, so can everyone see the slide? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Good. All right, awesome. So yeah, we are here today to present to you um, our retrospective of the first 10 years of Farm to Plate and you may be wondering, you know, why, why are we looking into the past? Why are we talking about uh, the first strategic plan and the years that followed when only a year ago, uh, around this time, actually, we released the state's most recent 10-year strategic plan that covers now the years of 2021 to 2030. So you might be thinking the past is the past, the future is now, um, but it's, it, it is really important that uh, we have a lot, a lot that we've learned over the first 10 years of farm to plate and a lot to share about that. That's really important to what um, we do um, to develop the food system in the next 10 years. So, um, you know, it's really important that we take this time to reflect and understand what occurred in the last 10 years. Um, we wanna take stock of what worked, what didn't, how we were effective and, and how we weren't in implementing the first plan. And in doing so, we can build off and accelerate progress that we've made and avoid repeating uh, maybe some similar or the same mistakes that we made in the first 10 years. And then the second thing that I think is really essential to today's presentation, presentation in this retrospective that we've done is that the trends over time that we've analyzed and featured really put into focus why the new strategic plan recommends what it does. Um, so we, we now know more than we ever did about the food system as a whole, um, food and agriculture, and, and what you'll see in the retrospective uh, we think really validates what the 2021-2030 Ag and Food System Plan lays out for strengthening our food system in the next decade. And just to note that uh, this, this document is in the final stages of fine tuning our designers on vacation. And so we will have um, the official release and availability of the, of, of the actual report um, next week. So we, we do apologize for that, but um, I will be really covering um, the essentials of it today. So before diving into the results and analysis of the trends, I think it's really, it's important to reiterate the history process and theory of change behind the Farm to Plate Investment Program. Um, and, and this, the retrospective really takes the time to do this as well. So the approach taken the last 10 years, it, it matters. And, and this approach, so taking a systems perspective, working as a network in a collaborative and mutually beneficial ways, is really, it's, it's, it was essential then and it's essential now. Um, and so if we go back to 2009, there was a confluence of threats and opportunity, opportunities facing food and agriculture in Vermont um, that in some ways may feel familiar uh, to us today and in other ways it was different. Um, so mainly we had a milk price crisis in 2009 juxtaposed with a lot of emergent excitement for local ag and local food development. In response to this, uh, we had representatives from uh, the Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility in rural Vermont who collaborated with members of House Ag and Commerce Committees and Senate Ag and Economic Development Committees during the 2009 legislative session to craft the Farm to Plate Investment Program legislation. And this legislation was passed with strong tripartisan support and, of course, signed into law by Governor uh, Jim Douglas in, in May of 2009. And so this legislation tasked us, the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, in consultation with, with, uh, what is, what, with what no longer exists, the Vermont Sustainable Ag Council, with developing a strategic plan for ag and food system development. And it was focused on the three intended outcomes that you see listed there on the left. So the investment program was really about, you know, the first two items being about focused on economic development um, in, the, in the farm and food sector and creating jobs in, in that sector and economy. And then the third was based around improving access to healthy local foods. Um, and really what followed 
from that was the first of its kind, an agriculture plan that took on a full systems approach and examined all aspects of the supply chain and support system. And that's represented in that uh, diagram on the right. Um, and in doing so, what this did was demonstrate the true scale, impact, and importance of agriculture and food to Vermont's economy. Uh, and this in turn helped shift the narrative about the prospects of ag in Vermont and created a broad acceptance that you know, agricultural development is also economic development. And, and this is a message I think we need to keep emphasizing as we move into this ne next decade. Um, and, and we'll see from the results that this is absolutely true. Um, investments in, in agriculture and food have significant impacts on Vermont's economy and, 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 and Vermonters well-being uh, for that matter as well. So we then take the plan and the Farm to Plate Network uh, was created around that in 2011. And uh, the network was shaped by, by the framework uh, of, of the plan. So it built itself around this soil to soil supply chain framework. And just, just kind of to note that diagram on the right is kind of the network diagram that we've used for a number of years. That inner ring of sort of the blue circles were what we call working groups. And those groups represented high leverage areas in the system that corresponded to the plan soil to soil framework. And then outer rings are cross cutting teams. And as their name suggests, they corresponded to the cross cutting issues in the plan. And the important thing about this really to take away is that all of this was done with the idea that if we coordinate action around the leverage points and cross cutting issues, we can drive systemic change and reach the plan's 25 goals and make, you know, in turn, uh, strengthen our food system, make Vermont better off. So that's the, the, the underlying approach and, and reason that the network exists. It's there to implement the plan. And so the network in turn directly implemented strategies from the plan. It did stuff. It created new resources, conducted workshops and trainings, delivered technical and business assistance, access greater funding for farms, food business, businesses and support organizations. And the images there on the right is just kind of a sampling of, of some of the activities, uh, uh, reports um, and, and various things that were produced over the 10 years. We have a full um, kind of sampling of, of all of the activities that occurred over the 10 years in the, in the retrospective document. Um, so the, the network did a lot of things directly. And then also the network influenced actions of others through convening, information sharing, networking, and relationship building. So in turn, the plan was implemented also by others outside of network activities through enhanced coordination, utilization of resources, and strategic action by partners. And what's really incredible is that over 600 organizations have participated in network projects, activities, gatherings, and more since 2011. So um, this is really, you know, this has involved uh, a lot of people, organizations, businesses, uh, institutions, um, agency staff, you know, over these 10 years. Um, and, and that's something that uh, we really value the, those contributions and the time that people have taken to be a part of this network. Um, and, and I think it's just, that's, that's really um, an incredible uh, feat in and of itself to have over 600 of these uh, organizations uh, be a part of this. And, so just a quick kind of assessment of how, how, did, how did the network do and how did, VSJF, how did VSJF do in administering the program and facilitating the network? Here are some results, uh, survey results that span, the ranges span um, uh, results from 2014 to 2020. Um, and as you can see, you know, the network was, was highly valued for its ability to, to share information, create relationships, uh, help organizations achieve their goals, and also that, it, that VSJF itself was also effective in, in its job of coordinating the network. And then I think the quote there uh, from Richard Burkfield, ED of Food Connects, really encap encapsulates the sentiment of many people who participated. Uh, and so there you can see that Richard said, uh, you know, farm to place provided an accessible venue. Um, let me move that. <laughs> An accessible venue for groups like Food Connects to engage in valuable cross-sector relationships that have resulted in significant changes in how we work to accomplish our mission. Farm to Plate has helped us build our own organizational capacity by asking better questions, developing stronger relationships, and delivering more relevant programming for a larger impact. Farm to Plate makes us smarter. 
So that's how, that's just a quick assessment of the network and uh, NVSJS role in this. But let's now get to, I think, probably what you all are most interested in. And that's more of the, a deep dive into the results. Um, you know, what, what has been accomplished over the first 10 years? And I'm, we're gonna, it, the retrospective breaks this down into two parts and I'm gonna go over this in two parts. So, uh, so part one, addresses how many of the 54 high priority strategies from the strategic plan were worked on and accomplished. And then part two, which I'll get to, evaluates data across food system categories to determine how things change for the better or worse over the first 10 years of the program's existence. So in other words, part one covers how well we did in implementing priority strategies from the plan, and part two covers whether or not Vermonters are actually better off for it. So here, looking at um, how well did we do in implementing strategies from the plan. So nearly 80% of high priority strategies were either fully completed or a strategy still underway or partially completed at this time. So there were, there were strategies that were um, very discreet um, and therefore um, kind of easy to say that you know, they were fully completed um, either by the farm to plate network. So there's kind of two distinctions here. The strategies that, are, that were either completely completed or partially completed by the farm to plate network or by other entities. Um, and so there are also strategies that uh, were very complex or multifaceted. And therefore, um, in our assessment, we, we can't say that, yes, they have been completed in their entirety, but there are really essential elements of those strategies that have, in fact, um, been accomplished. And so, so looking at it, Near, again, nearly 80% of, of high priority strategies, 43 of the 54 fall into that distinction of either fully completed or partially completed. Um, and, and the partially completed strategies, many of those have, have now you know, made their way into the new strategic plan um, and taken, you know, evolved and taken on new form. So that leaves 20% uh, of high priority strategies that we either, were either not completed and that's because initial planning or research revealed the project to actually be um, infeasible or the strategy maybe to be irrelevant due to changing conditions. Um, so just being open to the fact that strategies that may have been developed in 2000 over the course of, you know, from 2009 to the plans released in 2011, things change and those priority strategies may not have been actually um, as high priority as, as we had thought. Um, and I think that's one of just the values too of the network is that it's able to adapt to changing circumstances. And then there were, um, so about 9% uh, of, of the strategies fall into that bucket. And then there were some actions, 11% uh, um, or six, six of the 54, where no action was taken, um, but the strategy could still be valuable to implement. And um, this just came down to whether it was prioritization or um, an inability to, to sort of coalesce organizations around implementing a certain strategy. Um, so there were some that just simply were not, were not acted on, but only six of the 54 um, fell into that category. So I think um, to say that 43 of 54 high priority strategies have been either fully implemented or partially completed in some way, uh, I think is a, is, is a really good sign and impressive and shows the level of, of coordination and focus that has occurred over the last 10 years. Um, and also the importance of just having this plan in place to guide that. So now let's go to the second part of the results, is Vermont better off? Um, and first, just taking a quick snapshot at a macro level, uh, if we were to look at the, you know, the three legislative outcomes around economic development and access to food, healthy food, here are some key bullet points. So over the 10 years, Vermont's food system economic output has expanded by 57.7%. So from 7 point, you know, roughly 7.6 billion to 11.9, nearly $12 billion of economic output coming from um, farms, food manufacturers, uh, wholesaling and trade. Um, so some, some really significant um, growth in, in economic output in the food system. And then uh, I'll get into this a little later, but so pre-COVID food system employment, um, just because you know, COVID has definitely thrown some complications here as to how we assess things. Um, so pre-COVID food system employment, 2011 to 2019 increased 11%. 
6,189 net new jobs. And that and and over that time, then we also got to a point where more than 65,000 Vermonters are directly employed by over 11,500 farms and food related businesses. Um, so again, just you know, a tremendous amount of people are involved in food and agriculture in Vermont. It's it's a substantial industry of scale that um, you know impacts a lot of Vermonters directly and indirectly. And then uh, I'll go into this further a little later too. Local food purchases. So uh, the the purchase of local products within Vermont um, rose from 114 million to 412 million uh, from 2010 to 2020. And that's going from 5% to 17.8% of the total amount spent on food in the state annually. And remember, our initial goal was actually to go from 5 to 10%. So we have far surpassed what we thought was possible in the first decade. And now we have set the, the, the goal of getting that 17.8% to 25% by 2030. And then a note about household food insecurity. Um, so in terms of access uh, to, to local food and, and just overall improvement of, of, you know, of, of addressing um, hunger and food insecurity in the state. Um, so food insecurity declined from 2010 to 2020. Um, so now 8.6% of Vermont households face food insecurity down from 13.8% in 2010. However, and again, I, I will go into this a little more later on, um, there is research uh, that has been conducted by the National Food Access and Code Research Team uh, within Vermont that reveals substantially higher food insecurity rates over 2020 and 2021 uh, due, to the, due to the pandemic that uh, range from 27% to 29%. And um, yeah, there's some, there's some nuance here, uh, but I think what this shows is that um, a lot of efforts to address food insecurity in Vermont have been highly effective you know, in our times of stability. And that clearly we still though have more work to do in how we prepare um, for disasters or pandemics or situations in which, you know, conditions change rapidly and um, food insecurity um, as has been revealed by that research um, increases rapidly. Okay, so let's start with land. Um, if we look at uh, land, land and agriculture, uh, over the course of 2007 to 2017, oftentimes this range 2007 to 2017 is used because that's the ag census. Um, we're going off of ag census releases and the next one will not be until 2022. Uh, so yeah, it'll cover this year, but it actually won't come out until next year. Um, so we saw a modest decrease in farmland in Vermont, 3.2%. Uh, that's, that's about 40,000 acres. And the primary driver of this has been loss of land and dairy. Uh, so dairy land decreased by nearly 20% or 105,000 acres um, over this period of time. And then if we look at things uh, by acreage type, um, woodland acres on farms was the only category to increase. So this is the graphic to the right, while cropland, pasture land, and farmstead acres all decreased um, to varying degrees. Uh, cropland marginally um, pasture land is the category that showed the largest decline. Um, so pasture land dropped by about uh, almost 67,000 acres. And we attribute some of this loss to be, um, you know, so use of cropland for grazing fell nearly 25,000 acres from, from this over this period of time, um, which accounts for 37% of that drop. And we think that this represents both the loss of dairy farms and also um, some of the changes in um, you know feed practices uh, of the existing dairy farms, so you uh, you know less utilization of grazing um, in the dairy industry, uh, and this is so I would say this is actually something really important to watch for um, in the in the next decade now with new emphasis uh, through the um, through the Dairy Business Innovation Center, you know putting an emphasis on technical assistance for grazing. Um, I think also the opportunities for grass-based products that we see, uh, you know, strong market demand for. So there could there could be a, a potential, I think, for that trend to actually change over the next decade. And I think um, that's yeah, that that will be something I think we should pay a lot of attention to um, to see if grazing gets uh, reintroduced um, in the dairy sort of in the dairy industry and also. Um, just if, if grazing practices um, increase over time as, as market demand 
uh, signals a, you know, a desire for those types of practices on farms, uh, both, both dairy and, and livestock in general. Um, so, you know, really, I think land, land um, you know, some of this 3.2% uh, decrease is, uh, it, it, this could also just be a statistical anomaly over the course of the, of the census. So I think there's a lot of stability here that we can read into this trend. Um, which is a good sign, you know, our conservation programs are working. Um, we have not seen drastic declines in farmland due to development. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, I think um, indications here that policies and practices um, in the state have helped uh, keep, keep farmland in farmland and we need to reinforce um, those policies. And there's also new ways in which I think we can, we can address uh, issues of, of access and, and land conservation. So Jake, um, yeah. do, do we ask questions just at the end or? Um, yeah, if, if you want to, because I'll, uh, it depends on how, bur I guess how burning the question is. <laughs> um, well, your last slide um, where it shows um, like, uh, you know, cropland and not pastures down a little, but yeah. the next one where it says woodland, yeah. Uh, not pasture that looks up. Yeah, so and, that is. Yep. And you know, there's some people that tell us, um, well, we're losing a lot of farmland to other usages, and you know, those those slides there don't quite show that. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's overall. I would say the trend has been pretty stable, and and that there are there have been changes um, of um, yeah of of land practices sort of on farmland parcels, um, and so that's like where you know so some farmland has just reverted back to um, woodland, um, but it's still primarily you know it's still designated as agricultural land. Um, yeah. And so there's just changes happening, yeah, within the the agricultural landscape, uh, and I think that's yeah, I think you're absolutely right that sort of that's more of I think the way to read some of these changes. Although you know I I definitely think development pressure is is real and um, and and I think will only become more of an issue uh, as we're seeing uh, potential you know the pandemic migration and then we're going to see climate migration as well. So there's going to be new pressures. Um, that could still decrease that total amount. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, um, and then so just also, I think another kind of an, a positive trend to pay attention to is that so land and agriculture um, for other types of production, so the non-dairy categories um, have been increasing. So vegetable acreage has increased by 17%, oil seed and grain acreage has increased 49%, beef farm acreage has increased 9%, hog and pig farm acreage has expanded 25% and sheep and goat farm acreage has increased 8%. So we've seen steady increases over time um, in, in all of those categories. I think the thing sort of to be mindful of though is still the scale of change, um, you know, doesn't quite capture, it doesn't quite match the scale of change happening in dairy. So this is where, how do we accelerate, you know, the growth of these various types of production um, so that you know, any kind of decrease in dairy land or, or stabilization in dairy land uh, can be offset by um, uh, higher, higher rates of growth in these, in these other categories. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's all there is to say there. Um, now let's, uh, so kind of shifting now to kind of getting into looking at any more detail specific industry level trends. I, I mean, I think this is one probably you all are, are very familiar with um, most, you know, Vermonters. Obviously, this is a, a point of discussion a lot these days. Um, is just, you know, the the relative stagnation of of dairy um, sales over time. And uh, I think another piece of this too is is to see that you know average milk prices uh, in the last decade have, in all but two two instances, um, have. Uh, cost of production have outpaced the average milk price. Um, so a lot of stress here in the industry, but I think it's still important to, to look at this graph and say, you know, 
dairy sales are still $505 million. This is still a, a significant uh, uh, industry um, and, and significantly larger than any, any other agricultural industry in Vermont. Um, that's, so $505 million is nothing to sort of scoff at. And also that there's bright spots here. So 133% increase in the number of dairy processing plants uh, from 2010 to 2020. Uh, so you know, more than double the number of plants. And, and those plants have, have increased both on-farm processing plants and also uh, commercial off-farm uh, dairy processing as well. So uh, I think you know, there's definitely shifts happening in the industry. There's transitions, there's evolution. And value-added production is, is certainly a, a place of opportunity, and it's one that Vermont is, you know, has, has a long history with and is well-positioned to take advantage of. Um, but there's, you know, there's clearly, uh, whether it's new, uh, new investments or, um, you know, modernizing older facilities, uh, so there's, there's things that we can do um, to really help stimulate uh, this value-added growth um, and increase kind of the the, the values, the attributes of the milk that's being produced here in Vermont. And just taking a quick look at um, kind of three significant, you know, other, three other significant industries. So clear positive trends um, across other industries of importance to the ag economy in Vermont. Uh, maple sales increased by 21 million uh, in, the, in the last decade. Vegetable sales increased by 10.6. And then meat sales, excluding dairy beef, which um, I just, we wanted to do that just in order to understand the scale of farms um, whose business is primarily dedicated to beef um, and is not tied to dairy. Uh, so meat sales, um, non-dairy non meat sales, uh, if that makes sense, increased by 10.9 million uh, from 2007 to 20, 2017. Um, so we've got, you know, we've got some industries here that are, that are clearly experiencing growth, uh, positive trends, and again, I think the, the, the key message here is how do we, how do we scale these industries um, further? They, they, need, they need significant levels of, of capital, you know, infrastructure investment, um, technical assistance and product development and marketing um, to really see uh, you know, large kind of scaled growth um, beyond, beyond the growth that we've seen in this, the first 10 years. Um, so these are, these are real strong points, I think, in our ag economy right now, um, and the question is, is uh, you know, how do we continue these curves? Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I, I just, I think the the marketplace now at, to where they've reached is very competitive and is going to require intentional investment um, and just kind of, you know, upping upping the game uh, of of producers, uh, processors, um, and and the infrastructure that's available to them. So those are. You know, three real positives, and then on the processing side, we've seen corresponding growth in meat processing, uh, seventeen percent increase. Uh, that's about a, a net of ten new facilities from 2010 to 2020. Um, and we also know we're we're sort of back in a phase of though that um, we need to see more growth here. Uh, it's you know processing is a bottleneck again because supply has kind of caught up to the processing capacity. And we need to relieve some of the stress now uh, that's, that exists in these facilities. Some of that can come through investment in the facilities we have. Uh, so uh, that's equipment, infrastructure, you know, modernizing facilities so that they can take on um, more, um, more animals, more throughput. Um, storage is a, is a frozen storage is a, is a big issue amongst our existing facilities. And also um, investment in potentially new facilities that just increase, um, you know, increase the access to uh, slaughter and processing for our, for our producers. Um, and yeah, thinking about access just also across the state. Um, so that's, uh, you know, another positive trend. And then additionally, with manufacturing, um, you know, it's, uh, beverage manufacturing has seen significant um, growth over the last 10 years, and it's not just beer. So 139% increase uh, from 2007 to 2017 in beverage manufacturing. So other beverage production outside of beer, which includes wine, spirits, hard cider, non-alcoholic beverages grew by $93 million over this period. Um, so this is, this is an industry uh, that has a, a really strong presence in Vermont 
and one in which um, you know there's there's a lot more connections that we can make between the beverages that are being made and the inputs that are produced here in Vermont. Um, so certainly a lot of companies you know in, based in Vermont making beverages are using products uh, made here, but there's given the size and scale of of this industry and the the, the sales that they're doing, um, there's there's a lot more opportunity to make connections between you know our beverage manufacturers and our working landscape. So now, sort of going from production to markets. Um, so I touched upon this in the opening. Here is uh, sales of local food, um, so or or purchases of local food is kind of another way to look at this graphic. Um, so this is, um, you know, of of the food purchases being made in Vermont, how much how much of those how many of those dollars are being um, uh, used to buy Vermont products. And so this number um, has gone from 5% of total in-state food purchases in 2010 were local to now 17.8% in 2020. And that's a $298 million increase. So some, some really incredible um, growth here in, in that you know, clearly Vermont products are available across market channels and more and more Vermonters are demanding and buying local food since 2010. And this is the result of um, you know, so, so many different entities and organizations, both um, from a kind of a communication and education standpoint, but also a market development standpoint, um, ensuring that you know, we're, we're getting Vermont products into various market channels uh, for Vermonters to purchase. So great success here. And I'll just dive into you know, by market channel, we, we see growth across, uh, across market channels. So direct to consumer sales, 179% increase. Um, and this is, this is um, also just to note that this is farm and food processor direct sales. Uh, so this is not just only what the census reports, but some figures that we've collected from food manufacturers as well. Um, so direct markets, clearly a, a really important um, base uh, for our producers still and an important way in which they reach consumers. Institutions, 193% uh, increase from 2010 to 2020. Um, and you know, we've seen across the boards, hospitals, higher ed, K through 12 schools have all increased their purchasing. So this is indicative of um, you know, the, the success and, and the results of, of all the hard work that those in farm to school, um, farm to institution, farm to hospital, healthcare without harm, you know, all of these entities uh, working to increase um, purchasing of local in our institutions. And clearly there's success there. The 2020 figure is um, very clearly affected by COVID in, in uh, that higher ed did see a, a decline in purchases from 2017 to 2020. Um, that's because their overall food purchasing decreased over this time. As we know, you know, when institutions um, closed, um, that you know, our producers look to other markets to sell their food to, and so um, you know, things did not ramp up uh, to normal levels, and they they still aren't quite at normal levels. Um, and so, the higher ed purchasing amount uh, declined to uh, declined from 2017 to 2020. But I think we we. We expect to see a rebound here as things uh, continue to normalize and um, schools and institutions continue to navigate um, just the pandemic. Um, so, but I think the takeaway here is though that, you know, the, the, um, the work that, that many have done uh, to increase purchasing in, in institutions has been a success. And then local food retail sales, 32%, um, but that's $31 million increase. Uh, for 20 from 2014 to 2020 and we started doing um, independent grocers work around direct technical assistance around uh, 2016 we started doing research around this in 2014 um, so really great to see that as we focused on the retail market channel we have we have seen results we have seen growth in in local purchasing uh, by food retailers and so this includes uh, co-ops, uh, supermarkets, um, and independent grocers. And now to put, to put this into perspective, right, if we compare the 2020 purchasing by these different market channels, 
you know, retail grocery stores are by, by a, a large number uh, still the largest purchaser of, of local food. And, and we have yet to, you know, we've, we've dedicated attention to this market channel, but not to the extent that we may have dedicated to other market channels. And so there's still a lot of opportunity uh, to impact the, the retail grocery marketplace. Um, and I, and you'll see restaurants is in here too. We didn't have a trend line for restaurants just because of the, the inconsistency and in sort of how data has been collected over time. But now we'd have a good, uh, I think we have a good method of doing it. So we'll, we should be able to report on trends there, um, in the coming years. Um, so, you know, thinking about retail grocery, um, that is a market channel. Uh, this again is where, you know, infrastructure investment, investment in distribution and logistics, um, and just and 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 then also marketing becomes a really big factor in in um, having access to the retail grocery marketplace and and growing sales here not only in state but also out of state. Um, you know the the retail grocery marketplace is huge in Vermont and it's it's really big <laughs> um, in you know the metro the metro areas that surround us. So uh, this is an area where. You know, the strategic plan has recommendations uh, focused on retail, and um, I think we can. There's a lot of progress to be made. Okay, I'm gonna. We're we're almost we're almost there. I I, I appreciate kind of hanging in through all these slides and a lot of data, but um, you know this. Uh, yeah, we're we're almost we're almost to the finish line. So if we look at education workforce, um, this speaks to you know the the graphic on the left um the blue pins indicate schools that have received uh, state farm to school funding so nearly approximately half of the schools in vermont have received support to date and that spans um really you know the full geography of, of vermont uh and there's still you know many more that um can can be impacted by uh, farm to school investments but i think that's uh really uh, again, an incredible achievement that we've already reached um, half the schools in Vermont through those uh, through that funding. Um, and additionally, uh, 2018 survey results. So 65% of schools connect with local farmers or farms and 61% have already integrated farm school into the curriculum. Uh, and, and this is you know, where we're developing um, you know, kind of enlight enlightened consumers and food citizens and really integral to uh, what the next gen, you know, how the next generation interacts with with uh, the working landscape, um, and what they think about local food and local food production. So, really essential uh, from an educational standpoint, but also uh, from a consumer standpoint, and then also from a workforce standpoint. Um, you know, we need people to have a connection to the land in order to want to work on it. Um, and then, also, I think it's important to highlight that career tech ed. Uh, has also increased offerings that relate to uh, food, food and agriculture. So uh, forestry or natural resource programs increased as did um, ag programs and as did culinary arts. So our, our career tech ed centers are you know, responding um, to this demand and, and preparing uh, students um, to enter the workforce in these fields. And, and um, yeah, there's, there's more to be done in there that actually I'll get to at the end here. A little more, um, a little more employment. So, and I'll talk about kind of the COVID piece here. Uh, so, as I mentioned, the job growth, you know, pre-COVID, uh, 6,189 net new jobs, and the big driver of growth over this period was food manufacturing, which increased 32 and a half percent, or uh, 1,609. It's almost 1,700 net new jobs in food manufacturing. Um, and, and now food manufacturing uh, comp comprises approximately almost 11% of all food system related employment. Uh, so that's you know, a very strong industry, not only in, in, the food, in the food system, but also in Vermont in general. And in, it's a, a big part of Vermont uh, manufacturing now. Um, so unsurprisingly, due to COVID, you know, food system employment did decline uh, by an estimated 6,500 jobs. And, but 95% of those losses occurred in food service and retail. Uh, so that's the yellow, the yellow band, it's basically the, the drop, 95% of the drop that you see in total in that graphic is, is due to that yellow band, uh, food and retail. And we would expect that uh, while 
you know, food and retail employment might not fully return to pre-COVID levels, that it's going to, you know, it's going to rebound. And so a lot of those jobs are going to come back. And actually what we saw in some of these other industries, uh, uh, some of these other sectors of, of the food economy is that there actually was some job growth um, over the period of COVID. So um, I think you know, a lot of a lot of the employment in the sector has actually has remained resilient um, over over the pandemic, and um, yeah, and retail was obviously uh, you know our restaurants um, and and grocery stores as well were obviously hit very hard by the pandemic, um, and continue to you know continue to struggle, um, and so in turn a lot of the employment losses um, it, that's that's where they occurred. Uh, so. So I, I would I would use the sixty five thousand. That's I think the benchmark that we're we're looking for the numbers to return to um, either in in the next in the twenty twenty one data or the twenty twenty two data. Um, and then you know I think the question is uh, can we can we grow beyond the sixty five thousand uh, in the next um, in the next decade? A uh, quick note about wages. Um, so hourly wages, this is probably hard for you to read, so I apologize for that, but just know that uh, wages across different food system occupations, they are above, uh, many of them are above the state hourly level wage for, for a single person. Um, however, if you adjust the 2009 wages for some of these occupations to $2019, they are higher than current wages. So that reflects that wages have not kept up with inflation. And this is, um, you know, following not only just, you know, in Vermont, but the, that, that's a, a trend of decades of depressed wage growth across the United States. Um, so still work to be done here in terms of, of wage growth um, and wages in the food system. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, there's, there's some good signs here to build off of. And then lastly, so we get to food access. Um, so I mentioned this. So from 2010 to 2020, the food insecurity rate of households in Vermont did decline from 13.8% to 8.6%. However, there are questions about how food security has been measured by USDA during the pandemic. And USDA is actually um, looking to uh, refine its uh, approach um, for sort of pandemics and crises um, uh, to adjust to adjust their figures and focus research by what I mentioned earlier the um, the uh, National Food Access uh, COVID research team um, has revealed that you know 29 percent of Vermont households were food insecure at some point between March and September of 2020 and then the most recent sample in the spring of 2021 found that 27 percent of households in Vermont were food insecure so I mentioned this but this again yeah, this really speaks to the need for, I think, better, uh, better planning and coordination of how we address food insecurity, um, not only in the time of, of a pandemic or a crisis or a climate event, but how do we prepare communities in advance, um, you know, and, and put the systems in place at the state level, at the municipal level, at the community level, at the household level um, to respond uh, uh, to these events and and not be food insecure uh, because clearly you know more than a having more than a quarter of households food insecure right now um, is just start is a startling uh, figure to think about. All right, and in closing, um, so next steps. What so what do we do with this? Right, what do we what do we look to um, in the new plan? And what will farm to plate be focused on in the next decade? So if we talk about dairy, you can look at priority strategies five, seven, eight, and 11 from, from the new plan, which offer ways to stabilize and revitalize the industry. Um, and that's and really in a way that uh, is inclusive of growing segments in cheese and value added products, increasing capital investment in, in processing, storage, co-packing, marketing, and product differentiation and supply chain development. And then also with that technical assistance. So that, I think those are areas that are going to be really key uh, to turning some of the curve um, in dairy um, in the next decade and, and also building off of strengths that, 
that you know exist um, and and have been here and in the dairy industry for decades. Um, and then in terms of other ag industry development, the plan has a lot <laughs> to say about how to um, diversify our production and support robust industry and supply chain development. So those, you know, there's one, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17, 20, <laughs> 29, 30, all speak to that in the strategic plan, in the new strategic plan. So if you're, if you're curious about whether it's a specific industry or just, um, you know, kind of large scale uh, investment opportunities that would benefit many industries, those are the priority strategies uh, to draw your attention to. And then, uh, food access and security. So I alluded to this, but so priority strategies 21, 22, and 24. So there's kind of a, a three-pronged approach here uh, where the plan recommends appropriating um, funds for, for a new program um, and then also increasing the funding for proven ways to alleviate food insecurity. So there's a lot of programs in place that are doing amazing work uh, that could um, do even more amazing things um, with, with increased investment. And then uh, the thing I was alluding to is also the development of a state food security plan, which is happening. Uh, my colleague uh, Becca Warren is is uh, project managing this, um, and and yet we still need uh, more more funding to make this happen. Uh, and this plan would ensure that households, communities, markets, and the state as a whole, you know, is prepared to effectively and efficiently respond to global or national food supply chain disruptions uh, due to whether it's pandemic, climate, um, or something else. And then just uh, speaking to um, some other areas, um, you know, so the, the environment is, and resiliency, you know, climate resiliency is going to be a huge part of, of uh, not only the next decade, but, you know, many decades to come in Vermont. So we have priority strategies there to enhance climate resilience and the environmental performance uh, of, of agriculture and, and food, education and workforce, um, you know, there's there's priority strategies 18, 19, 31, and 32, which are focused around career and tech ed centers, um, supporting and expanding uh, existing farm and food education programming, uh, looking at how do we increase uh, or provide livable wages uh, for and improve work workforce uh, workplace conditions through policy shared workforce programs and market incentives and technical assistance. And then also um, sort of more at the federal level is uh, looking at reforms for immigration and labor laws. And then, you know, racial equity uh, here is an essential addition to the new plan that was not explicitly addressed in the first strategic plan. And so all of our shared goals, economic development that span economic development, environmental sustainability and food access and security cannot be achieved without creating a food system that, is, uh, that isn't just equitable, inclusive, and diverse. Uh, and, and so you know, we, we need to deliberately focus on equity, racial equity in what we're doing um, in the food system. And so priority strategies, you know, <clears throat> two, three, nine, 13, 32, 33, 34 of the plan directly speak to this, um, addressing systemic racism, racial equity in the food system, and that spans financing, funding, land access, trainings, immigration reform, and support and allyship to BIPOC representation leadership and organizations. Um, and so I, I, this is, um, yeah, I, I really would encourage all of you to, to spend the time to, to look at those priority strategies in depth and the, the racial equity brief um, as well. And there's, there's legislation also you know, moving uh, that that speaks to these uh, strategies as well. Um, so, you know, our collaborative efforts through Farm to Plate are needed now more than ever. So we have 10 years of impressive changes in our food system to build upon. And we also, you know, we have a clear vision. We have goals and priorities and strategies to guide us over the next 10 years as detailed in the new Vermont Ag and Food Systems Strategic Plan. So now, now is the time to take stock in all we have accomplished to date and, and forge ahead and double down on investing in our food system to create uh, a more equitable and thriving future for not only agriculture, but all of Vermont. And we can do that through food system investment. So um, thank you for, for the support that you all have provided to this point and for your time today. Uh, and we'll now open up for questions and thanks before we, we go to Abby Willard. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, 
Thank you very much, Jake. That was a <clears throat> very good presentation and well delivered. Uh, do we have questions from any of the members? And I can't really see you. Uh, be, can we get the folks back on the screen? Carolyn, did you have any oh, questions yeah, me... from your crew? Does anyone have a question in my committee? I can't see John. There's John. John has a question. <laughs> John, go ahead. Okay. Um, Jake, I watching your PowerPoint, I was, um, I guess, first, I should say, I, I love farm to play support. I think you should, you know, probably get more money <laughs> than, than you do. Um, at the same time, to be just a devil's advocate, because PowerPoints sometimes drive me crazy. Um, <laughs> you know, have, have, has farm to plate and Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund and the, and the Agency of Ag ever ever looked at the data and said, well, you know, here here's where we are, but we never really had an experimental group, which is Vermont with Farm to Plate and 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 the control group of Vermont without it. So, you know, it makes me think of things like would would Lawson's have have become a success without Farm to Plate or Bar Hill or whatever and and you know what what food systems clearly you know thrive because of of your help um or you know whether technical or financial or or networking whatever and so that that, that i would suspect there there's some things that are really concrete you can say like we've made a huge difference others are you know i'm thinking of things like not not in the food systems, but if it was a, a good year for the ski industry, was it because ACCD did something, or was it because we just had really good snow? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so so have you reflected on that, you know, as a team, and said, can we separate some of this stuff out because it's it's a success story, but you wonder what other elements were involved in that? Maybe just the economy grows in that in that way, some of it anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I see also Ellen leaning forward, but I'll, I'll take a, <laughs> a quick crack. I mean, uh, to answer, yeah, very directly, I, we think about that every day. Um, and I think, you know, the thing for us is to remind ourselves and also to remind others is, yeah, we are not, uh, we are not the sole entity that's driving this change. Um, and and so it's, it's you know, the, the point of the program is not to take credit for but oftentimes it's it's here to actually elevate the success and make sure that we don't lose sight of um, you know what made those things possible uh, and and kind of uh, you know have a backslide of of sorts. Um, so so there's yeah a little bit of uh, there's there's things that clearly are um, you know external factors and conditions of the economy, uh, structural things that we do not have control over that influence um, you know influence this change. Absolutely, and then there, yeah, there, there are the things where we have made intentional actions and choices, um, and and help coordinate activity um, that you know either have amplified the change or um, have protect you know protected Vermont in ways against those external forces um, that are detrimental um, that that are detrimental elsewhere and to other um, food systems and 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 businesses. Um, so it's I yeah it's it's complex. Um, it's, we are, we are in, in interaction with a complex system and we are just one, you know, one part of that. Um, and so, you know, as much, as much as sort of the, <laughs> the uh, part of me that would love to, to see that experimental control, <laughs> I also, you know, I, I know that those that have been a part of the, the network um, and, and have, you know, benefited from it and seen the results would say, uh, you know, I, I can't think of why we would want to do that or why would we want to see a, you know, Vermont without farm to plate, <laughs> um, you know, and, and so it's, um, yeah, I, I think part of this is just having the understanding that uh, things at the population level, you know, no, no one of us has absolute control or influence over it, um, but we can, you know, what we've shown in the retrospective, and I think um, through the program is that uh, 
we are we are effective in what we do do, and and we are one contributing factor, um, you know, to the successes that we've we've seen and that have been um, shown in in the presentation today. Yep. Uh, thank you, Jake. Um, <clears throat> are there other questions on Jake's report? Jake, uh, I have one or a couple. Um, your report kind of in John, John and I were on a committee all summer and it kind of tracks a little bit about what we found out in the dairy industry where we used to transport about 85% of our milk exported out of Vermont and now 65 or 8% of it stays home and is in manufacturing here, creating jobs here, uh, cutting down on the transportation costs to go out of state. So, I mean, your, your presentation and that presentation kind of supports each other and what, what has happened. Uh, but the question I have is, if you, did you use your red meat uh, uh, group, you said, and it didn't include non-dairy. Um, uh, so if you included uh, dairy animals into that meat sales business, wouldn't that even be a lot higher? Yeah, it would. It, yeah, so I, I should have said that, um, you know, that the, the dairy beef sales um, is about $45 million. Um, so the, the dairy industry is also uh, the predominant, uh, you know, in, has greater sales, beef sales than other beef <laughs> farms. Um, and, and, and that is actually something we are, you know, currently working to uh, with a project that's funded through working lands um, is, is actually to pr uh, increase uh, sort of the coordination between dairy beef and, and non-dairy beef industries and, and improve animal genetics um, because, because yeah, that is both a supplemental income for dairy farms, but also a potential uh, diversification strategy that we see a lot of opportunity for them because, because they already you know, are participants um, in, that, in that market and um, are already producing you know, significant um, beef beef sales through coal animals, um, yeah. and also in some cases just smaller you know enterprises. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's a it's a huge part of of beef sales in total. Yeah, that would take it from up to eighteen million up to about sixty million if you added yeah. the dairy beef there, which is a you know, 60 million in sales, a big business. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from anyone? If, if not, uh, we'll move right on uh, to Abby Willard. Morning, Abby. Welcome. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Abby Willard, Agency of Agriculture. Jake, thanks so much for that kind of 10 year travel yep. through time. I, Jake and Ellen asked if the agency would share some of the examples of how we've been involved in the process and then how we've found the 2030 Ag and Food System Strategic Plan useful to our work. But I, I just have to make just a few comments on what I saw in Jake's presentation first, if, if you don't mind. Um, oh. I'm so proud of this state to have exceeded our goals around local food procurement, growth and economic output, and even completion of the majority of the original farm to plate goals. I think Jake did a nice job answering um, your question, Representative O'Brien, but the only thing I would add is that other states are the envy of Vermont having a farm to plate network and a mechanism that tracks this type of data, can share these trends, and can demonstrate growth in all these areas. Not every state across the country or even in the Northeast has the same accomplishments and growth. So while we may not have a um, ability to kind of do a direct comparison of what life would have been like in Vermont's ag economy without farm to plate, I think we can compare ourselves to our neighbors and feel really prideful of the growth that's happened here. 
Um, and it also explains, I think, why we're all so exhausted. This is an amazing <laughs> amount of growth and work and accomplishments over the past 10 years. And um, I can speak to the original position that I started in at the Agency of Agriculture, which was a position that, that your bodies established, which was a local foods administrator at the Agency of Agriculture, which was designed to sort of work in part with the farm to plate process. At that time, when I joined the agency, um, I joined in 2011, the position was created the year prior. I think there were three position, three programs of significance within the Ag Development Division, and we now have over a dozen. I think I was joining a team of maybe four, maybe three other people. Um, we now have a staff of 18 and 19 staff within the Ag Development Division. So that, that associated growth in the industries and the markets and the businesses that we've seen is also, you know, I think organizations are trying to keep pace and continue to grow and provide the support and services and funding that we know the industries and the markets need. Um, and I just feel that it's really powerful to see the accomplishments of this work. And when we invest time and attention to support various markets and industries, we make an impact. And when we create the space and prioritize discussions and collaboration and alignment around our goals, we change trends. And those are really powerful accomplishments of the past decade that has not all been accomplished by Farm to Plate, but very much been led by um, the leadership of, of Ellen and Jake and, and their team. So just really grateful for being able to share this data. It's really important. We, we don't have any other entity that can do and, or does do what Farm to Plate does about showing us um, this type of data that we can, show, we can um, utilize in our messaging and help determine where to focus our, our work going forward. So I love the trends. I really appreciate the data as well as just the progress that's been made. So I wanted to just mostly talk about kind of the, the 2030 Ag and Food System Strategic Plan and, and ways that we at the agency thought it would be valuable. And from the beginning, we always knew that it would and hope that it would guide the actions and the efforts of our program development, of our ag policy suggestions and the areas that we made investment. And we were so confident in looking to this plan since it had been such a thorough and thoughtful and inclusive process that the, the industry members and the food system specialists and all the research experts were engaged in the process and they contributed to meaningful pieces of this plan and the end result being this comprehensive approach in how we're gonna make ag and food system community change over the next 10 years. I hope Abby and her family are having a really great time in Florida. <laughs> um, Maybe you should have gone along. <laughs> I, I know that I would have liked to, that is so true. Um, so a few of the ways that we really value the planet and utilize it, the first being that just acknowledging this is a really important time for investment in the priority recommendations that are outlined in that plan. And sort of as we were discussing earlier, just the network has worked so hard over the past 10 years to build a group of people that can have conversations, articulate needs and share accomplishments. That doesn't exist in every food system and in every state where you can engage with people that you disagree with, people that you have had um, little opportunity for partnership and now sort of spending time together developing strategy. And having a plan for the next 10 years that's in one place where you can go to for recommendations and industry context is such a valuable resource. And most importantly to me, having the food systems efforts be aligned and focused in a series of directions that we've all kind of contributed towards and agreed make sense and where the trends sort of show prospect and with industries that feel supported and heard uh, is a really valuable 
strategy for the next 10 years. I also wanted to share the plan as a really powerful uh, planning tool and as an educational resource. So, you know, this work of sustaining our ag community and the working landscape in Vermont's food system is not new and we've worked on it for decades and the last 10 years of data really shows the progress that's that's been made. And it's really helpful to have a plan that includes really bite sized market and sector and issue based information that we can use and reference when we have questions when we're making decisions around where to focus and what's important. Um, it's also great to have data that speaks to the economic output and the local food purchasing values. Otherwise, that data wouldn't be aggregated in one location otherwise. So at the agency, um, because there was so much interest in the Ag and Food System Strategic Plan, as an example, we hold monthly lunch roundtables where each session, it's only 30 minutes during lunch hour, people, um, but there's a schedule for different briefs being on the agenda. And there's one person that sort of reviews the brief or maybe was an author of that brief and leads a discussion on that topic for the lunch half hour. And it's amazing to see the different conversations that come up around what current research and data is available, what firsthand knowledge folks have having worked in a particular sector with an industry and really start to hone in on where the opportunities that exist, whether that's uh, from the work that we know that we're engaged in or what was outlined in the brief. And it feels just such an important foundational um, kind of set of information for anyone who takes the time to read it. I also have had experience over the past, um, you know, few months since the plan's been finalized of how it can be an informative planning effort and lead many action and advise many action plans. So the vision was that the 54 individual briefs and the plan would serve as a reference point for where to start, who to call, and what to focus on for targeting funding. And knowing that there were so many subject matter experts who understood the food system and were engaged in the process sort of validates those recommendations and those opportunities in each of those briefs. In the plan, it's, if you recall, there's 34 priority strategies that were designed to offer the direction to our work and form the foundation of what we offer as approaches to achieve the economic development and racial equity in the food system that we're aiming to achieve, while also ensuring the environmental sustainability and access to healthy food for all Vermonters. So you've heard from the Agency of Agriculture over the past few months about our priorities in investing in meat slaughter and processing, as well as supply chain infrastructure. And both of those strategies and needs have been identified both in the data that Jake shared over the past decade, but also in the future plan as where we need to make significant investments going forward. We also used some of the marketing briefs and research that was done that really focused on major metro markets as potential expansion opportunities. So reaching consumers outside of Vermont. And that was referenced in the funding opportunity through the Northern Borders Regional Commission that ended up being a successful grant application that's providing infrastructure growth opportunities for food hubs to reach those markets outside of the state. There's a priority recommendation around supporting producer associations. So an initiative that we engaged and Jake actually led years ago and, and sort of has re-emerged as a priority and showed up as a funding priority for both the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative and for the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program. So both programs have made targeted investments in producer associations based upon it being a priority recommendation in the plan and demonstrated as a way to really influence and impact businesses through the associations. And then Jake mentioned and, and Ellen and, and Becca Warren and others at, at Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund have taken the lead on the food security planning efforts that you know the experience through the pandemic has really demonstrated the opportunity and the, the need that exists there. And that was identified as a priority strategy in the plan. And it's really great to see 
that those efforts are moving forward and being conducted in collaboration with so many other food security and food and feeding organizations across the state. I also just want to note a um, couple, just two more points here. One that um, when you look at the goals outlined in the Ag and Food System Strategic Plan for 2030, they really identify um, the focus of so many collaborative projects. It says yep. take a photo of the map that we've seen um, throughout uh, recent time. So one being. Um, there were many organizations that participated on a federal application through EDA called Build Back Better Regional Challenge. And those eight different ag-based projects that were outlined in that grant opportunity spoke to the economic viability and access to local food goals outlined in this plan. The project wasn't funded, but we're gonna talk about it this week with Senator Leahy when he's in Vermont to see if there's alternative funding sources that we can access to support those really important ag viability projects. Um, Agency of Commerce Community Development has their capital investment grant program that was you know, hugely oversubscribed from the pilot funding that the legislature appropriated. And many of those applications from the ag sector um, that, that the agency was at least privy to spoke to addressing the accessibility of and to Vermont ag products and the use of agricultural land and workforce development. And again, all of those goals being quoted from and referenced from this plan. And then so many conversations have happened throughout the Vermont Climate Council Action Plan development and the Payment for Ecosystem Services Working Group and many other dairy conversations as well that have really looked at farm stewardship and carbon sequestration, again, referencing goals from this plan. The one very direct experience that I wanted to offer as sort of my, my parting point here was the work of the Future of Ag Commission. So everyone was aware that the governor kind of ex through executive order established that commission and gave a really tight timeline for that group to start meeting in April and have a plan by November. So those really wise and expert commissioners recognize that there's no need to start from the beginning of creating a plan for the viability and resiliency of agriculture. So instead, they relied upon the existing expertise and the plan that was developed to help guide the establishment of their priority strategies and their action plan that was then presented to the governor last November. And it's amazing to see both the, the action plan priorities as well as the governor's proposed recommend for, 20, for FY23 that brought legitimacy to the program and priorities outlined in this plan. So looking at a marketing campaign, the support for purchasing local food incentives at schools, investing in the payment for ecosystem services working group, uh, investing in the working lands enterprise program, uh, the value of apprenticeship and mentorship programs for the next generation of farmers, the value of investing in the farm and forest viability program through VHCB, um, the importance of climate smart strategies to be implemented on farm, and the value of a navigator position to help businesses support through permit um, challenges and struggles. So I just wanna note that that this plan and the work of the, the network has really guided ongoing planning processes within other efforts across the state. And then note that the agency of agriculture really also embraced the, the racial equity focus of the food system. It's something that I admittedly will say that we haven't put enough and sufficient attention towards, but the essential goal to eradicate structural racism in the food system has driven the agency of agriculture to make an investment, commit the time and hire a consultant to guide us in some diversity, equity and inclusion work over the next year. Um, around how we engage as internally as an agency and then how we support our stakeholders. So um, I just have so much confidence in this plan and so much appreciation for the work that's gone into creating this really unified vision and process for how we can make the most impact as well as kind of continue to work in all the directions that, that we've set forth for ourselves. So. Thanks for listening to answer any questions that you have as well. Well, thank you very much, Abby. Uh, uh, I know you 
folks have all been working real hard and and you did have accomplished things which many times doesn't happen even if you work real hard so uh that's great uh, uh so for abby from any of the committee members um i don't do you have any carolyn no no one's hands are up no um uh, well, uh, that's good. Uh, not good that we don't have any questions. Must be you're doing a good enough job so there aren't any questions. And uh, thank you, uh, Abby. And uh, we'll move on to Abby Course, who, who's getting uh, rested up like some of you others should be. <laughs> uh, are you with us, Abby? I am Senator Starr. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Well, yeah. How come you aren't showing us where you are in Florida? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I wonder if she's at Disney World. <laughs> oh, wow. oh, I'm so jealous. I'm oh. going to stop. I'm going to stop video because it's all foggy from my sunscreen face. <laughs> that was, that, that sunshine was That's painful to see. Abby. <laughs> I'm I'm so sorry. I uh I just want to clarify that um this is the benefit of marrying a man who um works the hours of a farmer but doesn't farm. <laughs> oh, he makes money, you mean. <laughs> That's what I mean, yes. <laughs> a novel concept. Um Thank you so much for having me in. I think I'm here today to speak in my capacity as the co-chair of the Agriculture and Ecosystem Subcommittee for the Vermont Climate Council and as the farm and forest sector representative to, um, similar to how the, the governor's uh, future, uh, what was it called? Commission on the Future of Agriculture you know, why reinvent the wheel? And this plan is such a powerful manifestation of expertise and gives such a clear directive to how we might move forward. And so when we were developing the climate action plan, that was the tactic that we took regarding certain aspects of, of how we brought in thinking about particularly food security and how that integrated into the climate action plan. I want to say here again that I was um, honestly continually shocked by the pushback and the reticence to understand the immense importance of investments in food security in the face of a changing climate um, and was just really happy to have sort of the added level of credibility of this amazing plan to pull in and know that so many other people were working from the same plan. I, I don't think in this moment we can under, underestimate the power of um, all of us working from information and, and this plan to and how powerful that is. I think one of the things that we hear from farmers a lot and other folks in the food system is that some of our efforts are being recreated in too many places. And so the power of this is the more of us that are using this as a kind of an, uh, an orientation point as to how we move forward, I think the more effective overall we're going to be with efficiencies, not only in how we're thinking about the infrastructure necessary to deliver food to our people, but also the efficiencies within organizations and how they're talking to one another, which is a component of the climate action plan that we brought forward as well that you know we want to be really strategic about how we're thinking about these things how we're building out our food system to ensure that our people are fed because as we all know Vermont is a little player in the national and global food industry and so it's going to be really important that we sort of continue to forge our own way and I just don't think that we can say enough about the power of the farm to plate strategic plan in um, giving us all a, a, a singular starting point from which to work. Um, and we particularly focused on, I'm trying to remember, in the climate action plan, like I said, on food security and the food insecurity planning that Becca Warren already has well underway. That is a component in the climate action plan. 
Um, additionally, we focus on a lot of the meat infrastructure processing as that tends to be a real bottleneck that our farmers continue to talk about. And of course, as we're thinking more about transportation emissions and um, food miles, um, having the processing and slaughterhouse infrastructure particularly to ensure that our farmers can process and get their food to markets is going to be really, really important. Um, the other thing I can speak to is as we were the first um, mentor grazer site for the dairy grazing apprenticeship program in Vermont. And so I think to, you know, this push to invest in the mentorship and learning of the next generation of people who are going to be able to have the knowledge to interact with a landscape and then be able to produce food, fiber, and fuel out of it is going to be critical, particularly in the face of a changing climate. And so that is additionally in the climate action plan as well. And I think I'll just sort of leave it there. And then if anybody has specific questions, we can go from there. <clears throat> yeah, are there questions for Abby? Well, we got a real quiet group here today. <laughs> Must be on uh, time almost. <laughs> well, uh, our time our time is running really well. Uh, so if there are no questions, we'll go to Ellen. Morning, Ellen. Good morning. Thank you, Abby Course, for taking time out of your yeah of your vacation. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you thank also you, to Abby for your very kind words and uh, the, the, the partnership that we enjoy with the Agency of Agriculture um, really has never been stronger than it is today. And that um, is in large part dear to your leadership and that of uh, Secretary Tebbets and, and Deputy Secretary Eastman's. Um, and we're, I know I speak for Jake and that we are continuously I'm so impressed with uh, Abby, your your team, and and all of the different ways in which they are working to strengthen the food system. So um, right back at you. <laughs> and uh, so for the record, Ellen Kaler, Executive Director of Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. Um, I don't really have much else to say. I think Jake uh, did a phenomenal job of covering the ground of of where we've been the last 10 years and setting things up for, for additional context for the, the coming uh, decade. Uh, and, and Abby and, and Abby both uh, indicated why having that plan was so important going forward. I, I really just wanna uh, end this conversation today by just thanking all of you because honestly, none of this would have happened had you not uh, launched it all in 2009. I mean, it really was very um, strategic, very prescient, uh, very important. And, um, and the continued funding uh, of, of the program that, that is received uh, every year through the Agency of Agriculture is, is critical to making the work of the network work uh, and in terms of implementation. Um, we feel extremely accountable to all of you that you know we really understand that um, but for uh, your support and authorizing this but for the partnership with the agencies uh, and state government and support that the governor has shown for this program um, so much of this work would not happen and uh, and I think uh, as Jake mentioned and and as did Abby we are really the envy of 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 other parts of the country, they they look to us. We we are the we are the the gold star, the goalposts that others are trying to um, get to, get to, um, and so our little state, six hundred twenty nine thousand people, with our plan, <laughs> and uh, you know six hundred organizations participating on some level, plus all the the businesses that are engaged, you know we have this giant ripple effect. Uh, not just here in Vermont, but throughout New England and the rest of the country. And had it not been for COVID, Jake would have spent nine days in Australia telling them all about it uh, two years ago. So um, I, I really, I hope that you all can, can feel a sense of pride in what has been achieved 
um, over this last uh, decade, because it's not just the work that all of us have done that you've that we've shared with you, but you, we really view you all as partners in this, and uh, and couldn't do it without you. So we really hope that you also um, feel a sense of pride um, uh, and an appreciation for the role that you have played in this. You every year you make decisions, strategic decisions about changes to policy, changes to program, where you decide to invest scarce resources. Um, and we know that you've been guided in, in many ways by what's in the plan. And that is, that's huge. You know, you, you could have just set this up and said, here, create a plan. And then it sits on a shelf and we don't do anything with it. And you don't make any, any strategic decisions about funding, but you chose not to do that over the last 10 years. And I think that's really significant. And then finally, I'll just say that it is a real gift to be able to be given a 10 year window of time to act within, right? And, and so as Jake started off saying, we really felt important that it was really important to be able to do a retrospective of the last 10 years, because I don't know of another uh, plan in the state, in any other agency where we've been given the gift of, of, of being able to, to work on something for 10 years and then take stock in it and then plan for the next 10 years. Like that, that's really pretty novel. <laughs> you, you might think it's pretty logical and like, well, duh, like why aren't more people doing this? But it really truly is novel. And, um, and I think that the results that Jake shared of the trend lines are, are, <laughs> are all, uh, mostly in the positive direction. And the ones that, that are not as positive, it, it's largely because of outside forces that we don't have a lot of control over. And so then how do we pivot? How do we adjust? How do we try to go around those constraints uh, to the benefit of, of Vermont industries, uh, our ag and food se sector uh, industry? You know, I was, I was thinking about um, that stat about the increase in milk uh, processing that's happened in state and, and Senator Starr, you, you referenced that as well. And that was one of the recommendations in the original plan was to shift and get make the investment in getting more milk dairy processing happening in the state. And we did that. And it's because we focused on it, we invested in it, we stayed together on that mission um, and the private sector stepped up and, and made those investments. And, and I think that's part of what we're, what we're really about building here is that we all have a role to play and, uh, and if we're all doing th that together in a collaborative way, we can really make uh, significant change happen and make big things happen for a lot of people and for the state. And so I just wanna uh, express just my incredible gratitude for all of you and for your partnership in all of this along the way. And uh, I'm really looking forward to actually what we can achieve in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. I think we're, we, uh, we have the potential to go farther and faster uh, at achieving our, our, our desired outcomes because we've got this really strong foundation of the last 10 years uh, that we're standing on and that we can move forward with. So thank you so very much for your time today, for your ongoing support, and uh, really, really do look forward to the time when we can all be in the same room again together. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Alan. Um, yeah, I, I think over the years of the different programs that I've been part of is just because maybe I've been there so long. <laughs> but if you think of, you know, current use uh, was just for forestry and the dairy compact and the VHCB organization, there was, you know, no Gus Selick or that. And of course, Farm to Plate wasn't wasn't around and but if you really think of the success of of those different programs it it was the people that were in place stuck with it um, you know the continuity of of people that kept it all going and and you know the results uh, the results have been super good. I mean, anybody, I don't know how anyone could argue against um, what we've been told this morning. Um, you know, it, it's just so great that things have worked out the way they have, because we in the legislature 
you know, we set up new programs and uh, at times, and two or three years later, they're dead. Um, these have all, you know, farm to, to plate has, has really done a, a super good job. And you, you guys that are on the front lines that are running this, um, you know, deserve, deserve the credit. Um, so are there questions for, for any of our panelists that we've had on uh, this morning? Questions in the one in my committee? You, you've done such a good job. You put everybody uh, right out of the questioning uh, mode. Um, but, um, you know, anytime, you know, I should say anytime you want to come before the committees or if you need uh, help with something that we can help you with, uh, you know, we, we carry that farm to plate book around like it's a Bible. Uh, and uh, so, and it's amazing how we'll pull that out from time to time to see if we're getting, you know, staying on track. But um, again, uh, I think it's pushing toward noon time. Uh, some of us have meetings during lunch hour and it, it'll just be so darn good if we ever get back to Montpelier to be able to sit around the table and and have a good uh, visit uh, like we have to do now on Zoom. It's, uh, yeah, I really miss not not seeing everybody. And and uh, so that'll be great if we get back. And so keep up the, the good work. And, and again, you know, don't be strangers. If there's something we can help with, uh, please uh, let us know. So um, if there are no other comments, we'll, we'll adjourn the meeting.